Thank you everyone for uh, joining our seminar, uh, even though this is not the usual time for the seminar. Let me introduce our speaker today, Dr. Uh, Chen Guang Wang. Dr. Wang is our faculty candidate for the CS, uh, for the data science department. Uh, Dr. Wang is currently a postdoc in computer science at UC Berkeley. Before that, he was a research scientist at Amazon AI and a research staff member at IBM Research. His research interests lie in the area of uh, data science, natural language processing, uh, security systems, and machine learning. Uh, his recent work is a focus on trustworthy text understanding, a very interesting topic. Uh, his topic today is towards trustworthy knowledge sharing of language models. So Dr. Wang, this is our stage now. Yeah, thanks for the uh, introduction. And uh, yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be in the uh, in JIT actually. Um, uh, I'm, I'm currently a postdoc at the Berkeley. I'm going to uh, talk about my research on uh, towards trustworthy and not sharing of language models today. So let's get started. So a uh, little bit background. So uh, pre-trained language models such as BERT GP3 um, actually plays a very important um, role in text understanding um, recent years and has significantly improved the downstream uh, performance. For example, in natural language understanding, uh, question answering, and co-completion. Uh, this is mainly because the pre-trained language models actually share the knowledge with downstream tasks. So first, the pre-trained language models actually uh, try to learn knowledge from this um, textual corpus um, while training to predict what words comes next, and then save the parameters. Actually, the you know, knowledge is saved in those parameters. Then it will basically uh, share the knowledge with downstream tasks while those parameters. So you can see that actually the uh, model parameters store the uh, knowledge uh, in the textual corpus of training data and the pre uh, parameter sharing is a, is a default way uh, nowadays to share the knowledge. However, um, the current knowledge sharing is not a trustworthy. So first of all, what do I mean by trustworthy? So it in general covers um, uh, elements, um, you know, including uh, interoperability, robustness, applicability, and more generally, like the filing issue, security, privacy. So we can say lacking or trustworthiness uh, throughout the knowledge sharing of the pre-trained language models. First, you know, the um, pre-trained language model lacks, uh, especially the model knowledge, uh, lacks the interoperability. And the second, the knowledge sharing process from pre-trained language model is not robust to distribution shifts. Third, uh, this actually causes um, issues when apply this method in real-world applications. So the whole thing uh, actually prevents the adoption of the pre-trained language models in real-world scenarios. So my uh, research uh, aims to answer the question, can we you know, improve trustworthiness of the knowledge sharing of pre-trained language models? So the first challenge is the interoperability as the model knowledge is not explainable. So this is obvious for them, obvious. So for example, model parameters are just numbers, uh, they are not uh, explainable, so we can not understand it. This actually result Zelo um, last year actually um, ended its home buying business and cut 25% of the staff member. And the second challenge is the robustness uh, of not sharing from the models. So it is not robust to uh, distribution shifts uh, to uh, especially arising in the real world tasks. For example, when asking GP3 about what drug can help prevent COVID, uh, it will answer, give us an answer, which is drug. So as the knowledge being asked, for example, the good answer could be the fat direct thing is out of the distribution for GPT-3. So this is mainly because of pre-training uh, data distribution um, and the downstream distribution, for example, the health care domain are quite different. So the third challenge uh, is the applicability. At the deployment of the language model are not reliable in real world. However, this is very important to deploy the model in real world scenarios. 
Um, for example, when deployed GPT-3 um, into real-world applications, it has a reproducibility issue. For example, only a selected group can have access to the uh, GPT-3 API. And uh, you know, if we want to train model, it's, it's like a very costly, um, like over $10 million. So it's, it has a reproducibility issue. On high level, so my work in the trustworthy scenario sharing of the pre-trained language model develops techniques to solve the, uh, those pricing issues by first interprets the latent knowledge in language models as a human readable knowledge, and then explores the robust knowledge sharing from the, the pre-trained language models. Finally, this whole thing can empower uh, reliable text understanding applications in real world. So my research can be uh, viewed as a new way to work using pre-trained language models in a trustworthy manner. So in this talk, I will introduce uh, my research on enabling a trustworthy knowledge sharing on pre-trained language models that actually contains three modules deal with the three challenges. The first module aims to address the interoperability of the model knowledge. Uh, I basically interpret the latent knowledge in language models as explicit symbolic knowledge, so where humans can understand what's going on. And the second module addresses the robustness issue of the current knowledge sharing. Uh, this module aims to uh, um, uh, improve the robustness of the knowledge sharing from the language model, especially to the distribution sheets. The third module uh, deal with the operability issue and empowers uh, a reliable text understanding applications. Uh, also, my research has made a deep learning, um, uh, you know, especially for NLP data science, trustworthy and easy to use and has resulted in some real world impact. For example, I have created several impact for open source systems. Um, uh, Glue RMP is one of the uh, most popular deep learning for NLP systems with more than 200,000 downloads. And it is used by uh, third parties such as um, Amazon Alexa and Fire TV. Uh, and in general, my research has been uh, used in uh, different research institute in industry as well as government. My research uh, on high level at the, on the trustworthy text and uh, understanding is at the intersection of the data science, NLP, security and machine learning. For example, I de develop trustworthy machine learning techniques to improve the data science and NLP, as well as use this data science and NLP techniques to improve the security side of the machine learning. So I also build system to support the applications. Uh, know that um, this is not only useful for NLP, we can later see it can be uh, extended to other areas as well. So far, so um, we have went through uh, the overview of my research and why it's challenging and useful. So in today's talk, I won't be able to cover all the modules. Instead, I will talk about the first module, the interoperability of the model knowledge, as well as the second module, which is uh, knowledge sharing, uh, robustness of the knowledge sharing from pre-trained language model. So let's get started with the uh, interoperability of the model knowledge. Uh, by the way, if there is any um, questions so far, or uh, you know, in the remaining of the talk, please feel free to interact with me. Um, so. The problem of the interoperability of the model knowledge is that the, actually the model knowledge is not interoperable. This, the reason is that during the last three to four years, the size of the pre-trained language model uh, from, uh, increases from something like 300 million parameters to, uh, to current, for example, GP3 have over uh, 100 billion parameters. So for example, GPT-3 have like 69 neural layers and each layer is just a parameters and we, can, we, we cannot understand uh, what does this parameter mean. However, we need to understand the latent knowledge before its deployment in real world, um, especially for this kind of safety critical application. So the previous work um, focuses on more on the analysis of the models, such as virtualization, as well as the, like the evaluation of the certain perspective of the knowledge. Uh, the difference of this portion of the talk is that we want to uh, interpret the latent no model knowledge as explicit and symbolic knowledge, 
uh, to support this, I uh, actually I built a large scale knowledge evaluation benchmark, which is like a 1,000 times larger than the previous largest data set. So the key idea is to interpret the latent model knowledge as explicit symbolic knowledge. So in order to do this, uh, there are two important issues to resolve. The first issue is a, a capacity. So basically we need to uh, fully recall the model knowledge. And so after our interpretation, we don't want to, we have lost a good amount of the knowledge in the original model. As well as we need to address a representation issue. So we want to represent the model knowledge in a real human readable manner. So we, either, we humans can, can, can understand it. So we formalized uh, the uh, problem uh, as uh, interpreting, uh, you know, interpretation as extracting the model uh, knowledge. So key uh, uh, steps are, the first step is the, how to recover the model knowledge from a large scale test corpora. So the intuition that the model has learned the knowledge from text corpora. So we can just recover the model knowledge using the text corpora. So the third is um, we will basically represent the model knowledge in an easy to understand format, basically such as the triple format. Uh, we, can, we can know like this parameter actually mean uh, this exactly triplet so we can understand it. As a result, so basically we formalize the interpretation and instruction. First, we will uh, use the text corpora to recover the model knowledge. And then the model knowledge after recovery, basically we can represent it in a knowledge triple. So we are able to extract the latent model knowledge from the pre trained language models as explicit knowledge while the text corpora. Let's take a closer look. So the intuition of the first step, which is recover model knowledge is actually motivated by the uh, heavy and the uh, uh, many uh, from Stanford, they found actually um, model parameters encode the syntactic knowledge of the language. For example, given the sentence, the chef uh, who ran to the store uh, was out of food. So on the left side, there's uh, like a parameter vector space from a language model. And the, on the right side is uh, like dependency tree uh, from the, it's a gold dependency tree. And we can see that uh, the vector space um, distance recovers the tree. For example, the R2 distance uh, from the parameter vector space actually uh, approximate the tree distance. For example, uh, in the tree distance, we can see like walls and store, store are very far from each other. And uh, we can see the similar thing on the left side. Um, so more importantly, um, so this indicates that a small parameter vector distance indicates like the syntax uh, closeness between words. For example, uh, words and chef are very close to each other. So we are going to use this uh, intuition in our algorithm. So um, basically for our first step, how to recover the model knowledge, we basically have a example here. Uh, we sample a sentence from the Wikipedia page. For example, Dylan is a songwriter, right? We input it to one of the pre-trained language models called GPT-2, GPT, and it contains many layers of transformer layer, basically uh, a lot of neural layers. And uh, we want to focus on this particular layer, which is uh, attention layer is obtained from the four parts of the, this input sentence. And the attention uh, matrix is actually a soft max over the uh, queries, which are the query words, um, you know, the rows of the matrix and the um, cake vector, which are the columns of the matrix. So the attention weight, uh, weight matrix actually describes the relationship between the words, between the words in the sentence. And the attention weight is uh, always positive and the soft attention weight basically uh, like a Dylan to Dylan and the is to is is the largest among the other attention score. So we will also use the uh, uh, X to mask out the, the, the future words and the itself. So in order to find the relationship between each word, uh, we will basically, for example, find the, the next word, for example, to Dylan. So uh, we will have this um, based on the previous intuition. However, you know, uh, the attention weight is positive and the self-attention weight is largest. So we can convert it to just find the largest attention score to Dylan. So this resulting is, so is will be the next token that has a, a that is very close to Dylan. 
So similarly, we will ha have songwriter as a next token to ETH. So by doing so, we are able to use the largest attention score to basically find the next closest word. After we find the next closest word, we basically present the model, recover the model knowledge as a triplet, actually. For example, uh, is uh, describes the relationship between two arguments. So on a high level, we are now able to uh, convert the model parameters uh, as a human readable knowledge in a triple format. Let's see how to formulate the process. Um, put all the pieces together, uh, actually given a sentence, uh, dealing with some writer uh, argument here from the like the uh, non trunker we will know Dylan and the songwriter are non phrases, and the parameter weights from the pre uh, forward pass of the launch model. We will start from the first argument, which is Dylan, and we will uh, generate a new uh, relation token using a larger score, which is ease. And then once it uh, reaches a second argument, we will stop the search process. We will basically stop it. And we normally keep uh, top K candidates with the largest attention score, uh, the sense that there could be multiple uh, triples from the same, uh, same sentence, for example. There could be different relationship between entities. For example, there is a second portion of the sentence, so we will have another triple. So the process is called the beam search in um, NLP. To recap, so we are now able to basically extract the model knowledge uh, parameters as the human readable knowledge. So this can be seen as a new way to quantitatively interpret the model knowledge as the explicit and human readable knowledge. And the remaining issue would be how to evaluate the massive knowledge triples. So a symbolic knowledge uh, evaluation definitely is, uh, we want to evaluate but a manual evaluation is, uh, is infeasible due to the large volume. Uh, so the, our key idea is to just refer to the gold knowledge graph contributed by humans uh, for the existing knowledge in the knowledge graph. But for some new knowledge, we will indirectly uh, compare to the third part, uh, other automated uh, knowledge extraction systems, such as open information extraction system to, to, uh, to validate whether it's a true knowledge or not. For example, Dylan is a songwriter, is an existing knowledge in the knowledge graph vacate data. So we know, okay, this is correct. Otherwise, for example, some uh, knowledge like the, uh, the resonance of a Dylan is not in the existing knowledge graph. So we will basically compare it to a third party two, which is the open information instruction system. So we will know once it has a correct output, our answer have the same output from uh, compared to the two, we will say it's correct. Let's take a look at the evaluation of the existing knowledge first. So we basically uh, leverage the standard NLP uh, pipeline entity linking and relation mapping to align the uh, triples with uh, knowledge graph facts. And this results in a, a large uh, knowledge evaluation benchmark, which is like uh, almost 1,000 times larger than the previous largest uh, benchmark. We have the results on both benchmark compared to the, the, the previous benchmark, actually our result outperforms um, the previous method. And the reason is that we are able to provide um, interoperability, uh, you know, mean time to benefit the performance improvement. For example, given this task, what's uh, Naomi's uh, occupation and the, the previous method just output the teacher, which is, um, makes no sense because it's not in the context provided with the task. However, our master could output the correct answer point. So as well as the model um, uh, in our large uh, Wikidata benchmark, we are able to um, you know, uh, find out that models actually contain sufficient existing knowledge and the larger model actually store more knowledge. And the, uh, the arrows actually in our result are like over one third of the arrows are caused by the third part two, which is a non tranker So we can further improve the results in the future. So our approach actually can see it recovers um, uh, high quality interpretable knowledge in the uh, launch models. So second, let's see how to evaluate the new knowledge. 
So we compare it to the automated knowledge extraction system, such as open information extraction system. So our approach without any training or performs the previous uh, state of art, um, actually a super supervised or trained on the task specific open information extraction system uh, data basically. So the reason is that uh, we can see that the language model actually can handle sentences with uh, complex uh, syntax, syntax. For example, uh, this kind of sentence with a bad format, we can, we can extract the correct answer where the traditional master fails to do so. We can see our approach actually can recover high quality new knowledge as well, which are not covered by the existing knowledge graph yet. We also conduct some manual evaluation of the new knowledge. We sampled over like 1,000 Wikipedia pages, and we, we found that actually um, over one third of the uh, knowledge are new and also true, which are not in the existing knowledge graph, such as Wikidata. Uh, here is an example of the knowledge about Bob Dylan. So you can see some existing knowledge, such as the occupation of the Bob Dylan, which are already uh, in the knowledge graph. However, there will be some missing knowledge in the existing knowledge, uh, knowledge graphs, such as the residence of the Bob Dylan. Uh, we, we actually are able to find that the model also learned this kind of knowledge. We also use uh, interpretable triples to study the important societal problems, such as a uh, bi biases issue. So biases uh, is, uh, is a very important issue uh, uh, for now because it will lead the model to produce some harmful content to relevant group. Uh, so our idea is that because we now have the access to the readable triples, so we can use it uh, as a unique way, right? Unique approach to study this broader impact, such as uh, biases. For example, we will know we will we can directly look at uh, you know the triples is pricing the uh, biases. We started two um, issues. The first is the gender. So basically, um, I input this triple like uh, the occupation uh, gender, and we actually uh, from the triples we found like a professor is the male, nurse is the female. So we can see occupations actually demonstrating uh, demonstrating um, high level education or heavily male, male leading. And uh, also we, we, we see the uh, geographic uh, biases, for example, we ask the per person's um, birth, birthplace, birth country, and the person uh, with a common English names were, were born in uh, UK or US. Also, my research has support real world applications in academia and the industry, for example, it helps to improve, it's, it's used to improve the um, subtle queries in Bing, uh, search engine uh, in Microsoft, as well as helps to improve the product graph at Alibaba to help improve the recommendation system and the customer service. As well as in collaboration with, um, uh, for example, uh, academia research institutes such as STEM, uh, Harvard, uh, UCSD, Georgia Tech. And also this research has um, an online video uh, has been uh, viewed over 20,000 times has received some uh, media coverage as well. So far, is there, is there any questions? Yeah, um, hi, 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 hi. hi. This is a hi. Yeah, I have one question, uh, quick question. Uh, you're saying that your model cover 35.3% uh, 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 true knowledge. Yeah. How, how about the remaining, you know, like uh, um, re re remaining one? So uh, whether you, you discover some like, you know, like uh, the other 65% is uh, wrong knowledge or what? Oh, yeah, thanks for the question. I want to clarify. This basically means uh, we, we basically manually uh, label one on the Wikipedia. Uh, for example, we, 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 we conduct, uh, extract, uh, we basically use our approach to find the knowledge uh, in this one on the Wikipedia pages. And we, we also manually label whether these triples are true knowledge or not. And uh, we mm -hmm. basically uh, found that 35% um, uh, of the knowledge we found actually are not in the knowledge graph, the existing knowledge graph. And the remaining... Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. this basically describes the precision and uh, no, no, the, the, the recall, you can see, it's not precision. Yeah. 
Yeah, but the, the, the remaining is something. The remaining is the knowledge. Yeah, so the remaining, there are two parts. Uh, the, the first part is the knowledge already in the knowledge graph, uh -huh. right? And also, uh, there are some errors, uh, as I previously said. Uh, so there are like uh, over one third of the knowledge are, are wrong because of the uh -huh. uh, because of the non phrase trunk. So basically, it finds the wrong entities. So we cannot, you know, construct the correct knowledge between them. Uh, so yeah. we can okay. improve that part. Yeah, there are two so, parts. So, yeah. so in that case, it, it seemed to me like it is a balance between the. Uh, the, the the new true knowledge, the the existing knowledge, and the, the error like uh, you you discover error like basically one third each of them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the you know remaining for them there is a set set uh, sixteen five percent um of the knowledge. Um, uh, there is like a one third of the sixteen five percent of the knowledge uh, have some issues because of and the NP. Yeah, non phrase trunk. Yes. It can it can only be uh, verified by human. Yes, okay, definitely. It can only be verified by, by human. Yeah. And we also compact yeah. some automated uh, comparison between the um, to the open information uh, extract system. And you can see, uh, like I compared to the like state of art open information extraction, which is automated uh, knowledge graph extraction system, and we outperform them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because we cannot label all the triples. So <laughs> thanks. Yeah, any other questions? Um, yeah, I have a question. So um, are you only working with triples or are you also working with uh, ontologies? Good question. So uh, there are two parts. So the, after we got the triples, we can, we can compare, we basically aligned to uh, this slide shows the idea. Um, so for the existing knowledge, we basically aligned it to the knowledge graph, which has an ontology, basically. We can align to the, the knowledge graph ontology for the automated, uh, automatic evaluation if the knowledge is in the knowledge graph. And for some new knowledge that is not covered by the knowledge graph or not in the knowledge ontology, we were basically uh, evaluated as a new knowledge. There so are, you're only yeah. matching triples? Yes, triples. Correct. Okay, so you're not going any further. Uh, like, if you find one triple, you're saying that it's it's a success. Yeah. So so okay. yeah, the triple triple wise, correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, I think I will uh, continue uh, the, the the second part. Um, uh, which is uh, robustness, but feel free to interrupt me if there's um, more questions. Um, the robustness of the knowledge sharing from the model. So we have talked about the interoperability of the model uh, knowledge, and then we will move it to the knowledge sharing process, which is uh, focused on the, uh, focus on the uh, robustness. Um, so let's revisit the problem for distribution shift. So actually, for example, the pre-trained input distribution are very different from a task input distribution. If the task in input distribution is in the healthcare domain, we will see that words such as uh, symptoms and treatment occurs much more often, um, you know, compared to uh, birthplace and birthday, this kind of pre-train, uh, pre the, the, the words in the pre-train data. And this is called a covariant shift. Basically means the pre-train and the task input distribution are different. This is a major type of the uh, distribution shift. And when we actually train model on the pre-trained input distribution and then evaluate on the task distribution, this actually will fail because, um, you know, because of the uh, distribution shift. This makes the pre-trained launch model um, does, does not um, generalize to, to this kind of shifts. So formally, the problem is that current knowledge sharing is not robust to this kind of distribution shifts. Um, first of all, the robustness means that the task performance does not vary uh, significantly across in distribution sighting, basically uh, distribution similar to the training data and out of the distribution, distribution sighting, which are, uh, you know, the distribution are very different from the training data. For example, with the bird is trained on Wikipedia. And then at the test time, when we ask something about when was Elon Musk born, this kind of in-distribution task, it will answer it correctly, simply because 
this kind of information is in the training data. So this means formally means the model knowledge of parameter, the pre-trained parameters actually follows the distribution of the input distribution. And the, and the in the distribution task distribution are very similar to the pre-trained input distribution. However, when we ask something like out of the distribution, um, what are the symptoms of the COVID? And we only got an answer like uh, not uh, available. So this is mainly because the uh, task distribution, um, data distribution, and primary distribution are very different from the uh, pre-trained input distribution. Where the current knowledge sharing is not robust, we can see, right? We need ways to address uh, these issues in distribution shifts. So there are two challenges. The first challenge is of course, how to enhance robustness. This is a very important to safety critical task that uh, involves humans. We want to make it a generally right answer in these scenarios. A second um, um, scenario that the people often ignore is that in order to do that, we need this kind of a robust benchmark that contains distribution shifts arising in real world tasks. This is very important because we often have a model that works well in our uh, test data, which are very similar to the, our training data distribution. However, we will observe there is a large performance drop on the distribution shifts in real world, basically um, in real world test data. So we need to uh, have this kind of benchmark. My solution aims to understand and enhance the robustness of NAR sharing from a launch model to distribution shift data set. First, um, we will uh, develop uh, uh, robustness uh, enhancement uh, techniques to improve the uh, uh, NAR sharing robustness. And then we will uh, basically use a you know, proposed benchmark to um, benchmark the performance of the robustness enhancement techniques. Compared to the existing techniques on uh, model robustness, so the focus of this part is on improving the robustness of knowledge sharing process, which have many benefits such that there is no training data uh, needed. Let's start with uh, robustness enhancement. So the previous work actually on uh, robustness to the uh, distribution shifts focuses on um, the model robustness, including um, its robustness to the correlation uh, or the zero example. The main difference of this part is we want to focus more on the robustness of knowledge sharing from the model. To, to do so, we need to improve the robustness without uh, you know, model modification or training, so because it's at the test time. So the key idea is to how to improve the robustness at test time during the knowledge sharing process. This could bring a lot of benefit, let's, we can say it later. So we have this kind of input distribution and test input distribution are quite different from each other. So when the test time, we want to adapt to the pre-trained distribution, you know, similar to the test distribution, so we can use it. For example, uh, given this um, particular example, what are the symptoms of COVID? And in the knowledge uh, model, actually it contains information, uh, knowledge like Elan's birth date and uh, COVID. So symptom, however, we want to, at the test time, we don't want to touch the model. We still want to find this relevant knowledge to the task. For example, COVID is a sign, uh, a symptom is the one we think is more important for the, for the task. So we, aim to, we aim to address a current shift without changing the model. Basically means there's no training, no architecture modification. We are only using the original pre-trained parameters. Let's see how to do that. So the key idea, is how to weigh the importance of the model parameters according to the task. This is actually motivated by a data reweighting that trains a model with weighted data samples. Um, the, weight, uh, the weights uh, is, for example, the task input distribution over the pre-trained distribution. So we, we found this actually proportional to the um, uh, task parameter over the pre-trained uh, parameter because the um, parameter is optimized to fit the data input distribution. So this is actually the importance ratio we are talking about. Um, so let's see how it works. So for example, when, when we ask what are the symptoms of COVID-19, we will first have the uh, pre-trained parameters, which, which contains uh, the general knowledge it learns in a pre-trained phrase. And we are only focusing on small group of the parameters because weighting all parameters in Facebook has a large, a large amount of parameters. 
And then we will use this importance ratio to, to basically indicate in the pre-trained parameter which are the more important parameters for the task. And then we will use this uh, importance weighted pre-trained parameters as a task parameters for the, uh, for the downstream usage. We will apply, basically apply the idea of the important weighting directly to the model parameters in, at test time. There is no training involved. So I will go uh, over how to compute each item. And the first is uh, uh, pre-trained parameters. So this is a question for, we are using this example, uh, similar to a question answering, uh, which is formally called the factual pumping, asking question like what drug complement COVID. So the task is given a triple, which is missing the um, second triple, uh, second R, um, basically a COVID prevent by what? And uh, then we will input, uh, the task will also provide a context which could potentially contain the correct answer. So we will input the context into the language model. We call that a language model such as GP3 contains many layers of these neural layers. And we still focus on the attention layer, which is visualized on the right-hand side which describe the relationship between words in a sentence. Okay, we can say that the pre-trained parameters are computed quite straightforwardly using uh, the forward parts. And for the second term, uh, the theta, basically the task pre-parameters is unknown. Otherwise we can use it. We don't want to fine tune to get it. It's not robust. So instead we will directly estimate the uh, ratio. How do that? Basically, still the same question. We have already got the pre-trained pre parameters. So the idea is to match the pre-trained parameters using the task information, which are like a co-weight prevented provided in the task input. We will just keep these original parameters associated um, with the task information and just discard all the other non-task related, related relevant parameters. So this will basically tell uh, us that these parameters are more, more important and we will have a chance to basically uh, say that COVID uh, content uh, attend a lot to prevent it and prevent it uh, attends a lot to feather. We have a chance to answer this question correctly. So um, basically you can say that we are able to approximate the importance ratio while only considering task -related, related parameters. And here, actually, the task information is used to replace the training as a traditional techniques use. And let's see how to obtain the task information. So there are, in general, two ways to do that. The first way is to the manual notation. Definitely, we can use uh, uh, to annotate what 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 uh, task information. And as well as uh, for some NLP toolkit, automatic way we can also use, generate this information. So for existing uh, tasks in RP, in general, the manual annotation are provided. And for some new tasks, for example, we can just use uh, automated annotation from the RP toolkits. Our focus in later on, we will see is focus on the existing tasks. And here the comparison with the state of art supervisor master, uh, we, we have less annotation. And uh, more importantly, there's no training involved. So in general, a task information is much more efficient uh, to obtain compared to the model training as uh, it's often provided or can be, can be uh, automated, uh, um, you know, straightforward uh, obtain. So put all pieces together, let's say how to utilize the important weighted parameters to uh, make predictions. Still we have this input and provided with the task information. And we will have the pre-trained parameters. And after important weighting, we will know what are the parameters relevant to the uh, task. For this task, uh, COVID prevented, we will just use the largest attention weight to find the right knowledge for the task. For example, Feather has the largest attention weight to COVID as well as to prevented 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. And we will basically take a sum of these two uh, attention weight and the resulting 0 0.7. So we will have many other triples from this um, using this method. And we will be simply using the um, largest uh, trip, uh, trip, triple with the largest score, which is the uh, output of feather. This is because the, uh, the attention weights already, are already soft maxed. So we can say actually make prediction using the important weighted task parameters are quite straightforward by using only the max and the sum operation. 
And uh, to recap, actually, um, this method enables us to deal with a co covariant shift with um, a while in person weighted parameters at test time. There's no training involved, no modification to architecture, uh, you know, this kind of thing compared to existing robustness uh, techniques. And the method is um, independent to the model and the task. For example, if we have the parameters, if we have some task information, we can always do it. And the extension of this um, method is um, we found that, uh, you know, the not sharing always, sometimes share non-relational knowledge basically means the knowledge that is not described in the relationship between entities after the parameters in person weighting. For example, we have this COVID variant emerging, uh, which is not relational. Our idea is to refer to the uh, symbolic knowledge as the knowledge is to relational is relational and robust to distribution shifts, so we can improve it. So basically, we can incorporate the symbolic knowledge and uh, teach the knowledge sharing process to say this is a relational knowledge. So the first uh, solution is to teach now sharing about the relational triples from a context at test time. So the, our uh, techniques uh, is based on the contrastive learning. Basically, assumption is that the relational triple is more similar to the context than non-relational ones. So given the context and triple, and we have lots of this kind of element between the Wikipedia and the Wikidata. This is a relational. We will input it to the BERT, and we will have the context uh, embedding C1 and the uh, T text uh, uh, triple embedding in T1. And there is a non relational triple. And we will have the T2, and the C1 is still the context embedding. And the idea is to max, maximize the similarity if it's a relational triple. Otherwise, we want to minimize. And we have many other contexts and the triples. So it, to improve the, uh, to basically maximize the similarity if it's relational, there are two parts. The first part is to minimize the loss of the relational triple of the context of the, you know, highlighted as yellow. And the, um, and it's, it's like the similarity of the cosine similarity between the context and the relation triple over all the uh, cosine similarity um, um, of the context and triples, including the non-relational triple. So it's uh, basically a soft max over similarity score. As well as another part is the uh, loss of the context for the relational triple, basically the rows here. So we will basically add these two parts together as our final loss. We want to minimize this loss. So we will know that which, which relation uh, is more similar. So the similar relation triples, uh, triples are relational ones. So the good thing of this approach is that is there's no task specific training involved. So at test time, so basically we, we can formalize uh, finding the uh, tri relation triple as basically which triple is more similar to the context, right? So we have this um, uh, train the bird, and the, then we at test time we can uh, um, obtain the context triple pair from the parameter in person weight output. And uh, for this positive triple, we have T1 as a triple embedding, C1 as a um, context embedding, and for non relation triple, for example, we have a T2. And similarly, we will have the cosine similarity of the uh, between the context and the relation triple, uh, and it's larger uh, actually um, two than the context and the non-relational triple similarity. And then we can output it. Uh, basically, we we know whether it is a correct answer by finding out the relational triple. So this method on a high level it actually enhances robustness during uh, by finding uh, this kind of relational triple at the test time. So another, uh, another solution is teach it at the training time. So we, we have something, uh, we recently proposed something just published in uh, ACL this year. Uh, it's a structured pre-training. So the idea is to use the autoregressive long model to produce relational triples from context. So we basically model this as a conditional um, generation by given a context and generate a sequence of triples. So for example, uh, give a GPT, to, uh, GPT, which is autoregressive language model, we basically autoregressively generate the uh, between the context and triple by giving the token and autoregressively generate the next token, next token until we generate the triple. 
This is actually trained on um, a larger alignment between uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge bases and the Wikipedia sentences, which contains millions of sentences and millions of triples. And at test time, we can just generate the triples from a context. So this actually enables us to directly share the uh, relational triples to improve the robustness. So the uh, second part is the robust benchmark. So prior work on a uh, long model benchmarks are focused on in-distribution benchmark or some vertical uh, natural language distribution. The difference of this approach, we want to uh, propose a comprehensive benchmark focusing on the knowledge uh, aspect uh, and focus on the uh, natural distribution shifts arising in real world data. So we basically create a suite of the distribution shifts uh, um, on the knowledge perspective. So previously the model knowledge is like this and the focus, um, benchmark focuses on the in-distribution knowledge that are very similar to the model knowledge. And uh, then we want to focus on like different knowledge, like domain specific knowledge and task specific knowledge that are, have a very different distribution compared to the model knowledge. However, we created this kind of distribution shift uh, often cost years or thousand dollars. Uh, it's definitely resource intensive. So our approach is to basically aggregate existing distribution shift, cover 32 data sets, spanning 12 tasks and three domains. We focus on natural distribution shift, which arising uh, naturally from a uh, real test data and the uh, tasks uh, including uh, different knowledge, such as uh, what's a, a type of certain entity and what's a factor answer of a certain question. And it covers domains, um, um, biomedicine, news, and general purpose. And I want to show some results. Um, uh, so first, uh, of the parameter in person weighting, I show the result on the factual pump uh, master, which basically asks the general purpose knowledge, such as the birthplace of the Elon Musk. And here is the result of a master. We can show that our master with no training and less notation compared to the traditional knowledge sharing master, it significantly improved the results in our distribution shifts. And it compares to the supervised master that trained on this particular data set, actually our master still outperforms it. This shows that our master could improve the robustness to the distribution shift arising in benchmark real world tasks. And the second part is the uh, result on, uh, after we integrate the symbolic knowledge. So the first is uh, how the contrastive thing. So improved at the test time, we show it on the open information instruction is in the news domain. We can see that our master after incorporating the uh, symbolic knowledge, it further improves the result. Um, uh, by using only the parameter impulse weighting. Uh, also, we show how to actually uh, the result after training, basically at the training time, directly share the relational knowledge. And we can see that our approach actually reaches um, a, a 10 billion language model compared to the current state of art like GP3, which contains like over 100 billion parameters. Our master requests no training, uh, outperforms the tra traditional knowledge sharing significantly. As well as computer supervised master, is to train on the task specific data set, we, we generate competitive results. We can say symbolic knowledge actually further improves the robustness uh, to the distribution shifts in the benchmark. So this approach is actually resulting in some real world impact. It's recently used by UPMC, Human Cancer Center, to help them to discover the new symptoms for black cancer. So this is actually enabled by this robustness idea. Actually, it's very important for uh, critical application domains that involves humans. To summarize, the key idea of my research is to improve the robustness, uh, uh, no, improve the trustworthiness, including robustness, interoperability, um, up, uh, applicability of the language models. So this actually empower a wide set of critical application domains in science, uh, industry, as well as government. So some of my future research, so the goal is to, um, for my future research is to make machine learning more capable in real world. Uh, so um, with this, I want to bring the other institutional considerations such as security, knowledge, and ethical considerations, uh, just the essential parts of machine learning in addition to their accuracy. 
So on the knowledge part, I want to, um, for example, for the NSF query world, I want to focus on um, things like, is there a unified trustworthy in our sharing um, you know, framework? So the goal is to build a unified knowledge sharing framework that can collectively share knowledge between diverse uh, different uh, applications and domains. So I have been working on like knowledge sharing between two text domains. I want to extend it to collectively share knowledge between each other, for example, incorporating more model knowledge incorporating human knowledge and machine knowledge. And together, I have been working on the data science NLP, and I want to extend it to other applications and domains such as security, network, graphics, and the bio mathematics, and so on and so forth. Uh, another second direction is on the um, um, security side, which is basically trustworthy uh, machine learning or security side of machine learning in Chinese scenarios. So I've been working on improving the robustness to distribution shifts. So the goal is to uh, develop algorithm and the benchmark to enhance the trustworthiness of the machine learning. In, uh, for example, when it encounters adversarial attacks, when the privacy matters, uh, when it's in some low resource um, language, for example, other than English. So we still want to output the correct knowledge in those scenarios. So in, in the long term, I want to also broaden my research to comprehensively model the fairness, accountability, transparency, ethics. For example, I have been work, worked on the bias of the launch model. So uh, in the future, I want to design models uh, or method to consider broader societal impacts, such as fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. Put all pieces together. In the long, longer term, I think we together could build something like a uh, eco machine, uh, trustworthy machine learning ecosystem that could potentially improve the trustworthiness of real world machine learning in ma multiple um, you know, applications and domains with a consideration of the societal impacts. This could be game changing for data science and this kind of area. So, lastly, I would like to thank all my collaborators and contributors and users of the projects, and also thank the agencies and organizations that support and use my research. So thank you for your interest in my talk. I can take questions now. Thank you. Well, very interesting talk. Uh, any thank questions you. from the audience? Yeah. Um, Hi. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Fun. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to know, to work Excuse. with the BART model, did you use a Hugging Faces library? Uh, yeah, I think there are um, many libraries. So <laughs> I think uh, right. uh, hugging, hugging Faces is the easiest one too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy to use. So okay. I use that one. But uh, uh, in some of the applications, <coughs> Hugging Face efficiency is, is a, is, it has some issue. So, okay. as, you know, recently there are some new frameworks. Probably you can also take a look at them. Like, like deep, deep Speed. Um, Felsic from Facebook, they have better performance. I mean, in terms of efficiency, they have better support. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, you have a question? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, have, I have one, um, a couple of questions. Maybe, uh, maybe I ask one here and then we can have uh, more discussions um, later. So, you know, like, um, uh, in the in, in the slide forty six, right? You say that you improve the uh, basically the robustness of the of the downstream task um, without retraining and so on. So um, uh, you know, like why why you uh, in, in the slide forty six? Basically, why why you find the correlations um, between um, between the triples, right? And and that represent the the important weighting. Um, uh, like th theta task over theta pretend task. Why why is present you know, that's proportions? I don't quite understand. You have any theoretical analysis on that or what? Yeah. Um. Uh. So so the so the um. So basically, the idea is that um the, the research idea is that the performance um so large model basically contains um important uh, basically a lot of knowledge that are important for, for lots of different applications, such as um, in bi biomedicine, definitely contains this information. However, mm -hmm. the distribution of the pre-trained on the model, um, you know, so this, this, this are the, it's, not a, it's not the center of the distribution in the, in the, in the pre-trained data, right? 
for example, the biomass development. So we want to adjust that distribution from a pre-trained model, basically to, to tell the model that in advance that, okay, so these are the domain specific um, knowledge I want to know. So I basically mm -hmm. use this kind of task prayers to guide the model to, to basically kind of adjust the distribution to that task, right? So that's a, that's yeah. a uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I buy that one. Okay, so mm -hmm. I buy that one. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong, but that mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't represent the the mm -hmm. the, uh, the the proportion between theta task and over theta pretrain, right? Uh, I don't want. It's it just a, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it just one way you use the knowledge. Basically, mm -hmm. um, basically enhance uh, the downstream task, but it, it doesn't represent like some theory, like whether it's theta task over theta pretrained, uh, whether you know like. What you are doing is represent that pro proportions or not? Um, so uh, we we have a uh, lots of uh, I mean in general. So uh, the from a theory point of view, so um, I think the uh, this is motivated by the uh, data relating method. So it's uh, like a in person related uh, this kind of uh, empirical. Uh, you know, this kind of a loss, actually this is quite, um, have been some time. So basically they are leveraging the input distribution, <clears throat> the, the ratio of the input distribution to relate data samples and the, then retrain the model. That's the original approach. However, this is not feasible as I said. So the model are very large. It's very hard to, for us to just retrain a GP3, right? For, for, for example, yeah. for, for, for certain tasks. So we want to improve robustness. So. Uh, the idea for us is to basically relate the parameters, um, a certain a, a, a small group of parameters by using you know certain kind of um, um, uh, task information to help us to approximate this kind of important ratio. So that has been been the being the um, how to say the theoretical part of it, and also empirically we we basically show um, I think uh, in the in the talk um, uh, on. Uh, multiple, uh, actually we have 32, if you're interested, you can take a look at the paper, uh, but in general, uh, I think uh, this, so basically we are, we, we show that, uh, you know, in this kind of biomedicine domain, uh, even compared to GP3, 175 billion, our 10 billion model is able to improve it. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So, so in wait, general, wait. lots of the data sets. Yes. Uh, yeah. Actually, basically you approximate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a related question. <laughs> well, mm. uh, well, uh, quite related to what you have asked, uh, you know, to make the model applicable to new tasks, like uh, say COVID, generally there are two ways. One is, uh, well, fine tuning, right? The downstream task, you use the new data to fine tune it, which essentially is uh, just the perimeter minorly. Uh, you can imagine that, that we use the deep neural network way to uh, multiply the original weight with the weighting matrix so we can just kind of adjust uh, the weight. Uh, just now what you mentioned is that the other method which is, no, I think it's very original. That is instead of you do the fine tuning is uh, you directly uh, extract some, well, uh, covariance or some information to directly uh, re-weighting which is also to readjust the perimeters. Yes, yes. So traditionally, we have tried to both uh, readjust the perimeters, uh, one fine tuning, and the other is uh, using the contest yes. and using some uh, extracted coherent information. You're yeah, right. Yes. So my mm -hmm. question is uh, mm -hmm. to compare these two directions. I believe um, one may be more applicable for bigger tasks or large size, uh, the new, new data, or the other mm -hmm. one may be more applicable to a uh, smaller size or a smaller amount of the new data. So what, what is your comments? Uh -huh. So I, I'm trying to address the robustness issue. So robustness basically is, uh, is basically, we want, to, in general, we want the in distribution performance are sem similar to out of the distribution. It's an, the out of the distribution is not just one task. It is like a, a collection of tasks. So we, we, we should be able to derive something that are generally, you know, uh, good for this kind of distribution shift. So definitely, uh, so leveraging um, the master, for example, uh, you know, par parameter in-person rating is, 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 is uh, I, I think is the right direction because it's much cheaper and lightweight compared to fine tuning. For example, we have 32 tasks and different tasks have different training data, right? <laughs> All, 
even for some tasks, there's no training data, mm -hmm. right? And in, in this scenario, this, this is just a robustness problem. We need to have the performance guarantee on the uh, robust test side. There's, there's sometimes no training data. So fine tuning is definitely, um, um, I think in general, it's not the um, uh, right direction towards um, uh, robustism. Or mostly in recent literatures, I think fine tuning uh, it's, it's mainly in our piece, not mainly for uh, robustness improvement. It's more on like a specific task improvement. So the, the, the topic I'm talking about is the robustness. So basically how can we derive something like a general, generally useful um, to improve robustness to a wide side of the uh, collection of the uh, distribution shapes? Does that answer your question? Okay, okay uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I believe there is another one-to-one -one, uh, interview uh, right after this talk. So uh, let us just stop here. And uh, sure. thank you. With hi, so you can continue the discussion. Uh, well, thank you everyone for attending the talk. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.